just want to finish off my formal bit, really, because, and it was really interesting, I went next door and picked up, and I can see that um, you guys are really talking about body condition. You've got the body condition scoring um, wall-covered um, rubber thing through there. We've got those as well that our AHDB people would use. And, and body condition scoring is something I've certainly been talking about all of my career, uh, and, uh, and I've been doing for a long time. But with the work that we've been doing um, recently with this um, key performance indicator, is uh, we've been looking much more at body condition score as an overall thing. So one of the problems that we have, and we've had this today, is, and we'll go back to this one. When we start looking at sheep production, and we start saying um, what we need to do and the technical issues, and, and I've already alluded to this a little bit, but you know we can come up with lots of technical things. So what have I got written on here? So this one says, right, OK, if you want the best from your lambs, you need to go paddock grazing. So I might fire that one over there. And then I might stand on, ooh, now this is a really good one. And then I might stand on my soapbox and say, well, do you know what? Actually, what we're really, really aiming for is scanning percentage. You catch that one. OK. And then another day, somebody might come along and say, oh, yeah, but no, 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 no. What you really need to be thinking about is lamb losses. So you guys can have lamb losses over there. And I've got some more in my pocket. What else have we got here? Oh, this one says um, forage analysis. Uh, this one says lameness. Who would like lameness? Nobody in particular. Oh, oh there you go. I can't get it that far back. And this one says compound quality, feed, feed quality. So, oh, which table hasn't? Oh, this table hasn't had anything yet. Right, OK. So basically, and I could keep doing that for ages. There's a guy in Australia. I was on a platform with him a few years ago, and um, he allows me to use that now. But basically, what a lot of us are doing, uh, extensionists like me, we'll stand here and we'll do just that to you, won't we? We'll get a ping pong ball and we'll say, well, today's flavour of the month is this. You should be doing this and, and that and this. And you're all left thinking, well, what the hell's all that about? What am I going to take away from that? So, let's develop this theme a little bit. So, we have um, lots and lots of figures and we will look at things and we've talked about some of these today where we might start looking at uh, you know, and this is really showing the UK up in all its not-so-glory. So these are some of the recorded flocks. So these should be our, be our best end. And in the average there, they're only rearing 1.5 lambs per ewe. Hang your heads in shame, UK. OK, so we're not that clever. Um, but we will use all of these things. Ewe mortality there might be something else we would look at. We might look at, well, actually, reared was 1.39, which is even worse. Um, we will pick all of these things up. It might be we talked about empty use earlier on. These are all potential KPIs that we could use, aren't we? Aren't they? That you could measure and you could use them as KPIs. Um, and we'll come back to replacement rate shortly. And then we might actually look at live weight gain. So you can see there that of these so-called better end flocks, our um, overall average daily live weight gain is a pathetic 230 grams a day. And then they wonder why we're saying, come on, we can do better. Um, or it might be that we're looking at the amount of kilograms of lamb produced per hectare as a KPI. Lots of things that we can use as measures of how well we're doing. But on their own, those don't necessarily lead us to the sorts of things written on the ping pong balls that we might want to pick up to help us to try and achieve them. Um, so just to say, and, and let you have a think about this, so what makes a useful KPI? What is a KPI, a key performance indicator? Well, taking it from the business world, which is where it came from, you know, we're all really good at these buzzwords, aren't we? Really good at these absolutely awful buzzwords. Taking it from the business world, they would say an actionable scorecard that keeps your strategy on track and will enable you to control and achieve desired business results. That's a bit of a mouthful. Basically, what it means is, again, if you can measure it, you can manage it. And if you keep measuring it and managing it, it will keep you on track in terms of what your actual goal is. And that's what a KPI has to be. It's not something which is just nice and cosy to have. So a KPI for my guys would not be scanning percentage. 
because it's a bit like um, profit is, uh, sorry, t profit is um, sanity and turnover is vanity. And it's the same thing with scanning percentage with me, got my guys. You know, they'll go to the pub and they'll brag about the fact that they've scanned 230 or 240% lambs in their ewes. Well, that's just insanity. Um, you know, what really matters is how many lambs they rear, isn't it? Yeah, so scanning is not a good KPI, it's a rubbish KPI. What's a much better KPI is how many lambs, or even better, how many kilos of carcass, a production index, did you actually rear? So do you see what I'm, I'm driving at? A KPI has got to be really useful because it's got to drive you towards that question that you need to ask. Um, so, you know, what result do you want? What do you need to measure to guide those actions? And can you use those KPIs to keep yourself on track and keep improving? Or when you get there, and a lot of people say to me, well, how come you work with flocks for as long as you do? And if you get, they get to be better, hopefully they get to be better. Um, why do they keep employing you? Well, the answer is, I probably don't spend as much time with them, but the name of the game then is keeping them there. The name of the game then is to not have something crawl out of the woodwork that suddenly knocks you off target. It's a constant trying to keep it and make it more and more robust. So, you know, they're all KPIs that we can use and they would all be valid. Um, I put flock replacement rate there because I've had this argument with the AHDB. It's a bit tongue-in-cheek. We agree to disagree. Well, actually, no, they agree now, I think. But they've got replacement rate there, and they've put it in there as though that's something that farmers would think is either good or bad. So is a high replacement rate good, or is a low replacement rate good? What do you think? It's a lemon, isn't it? I mean, there's no answer to it, is there? Because of what we were saying earlier on, for some people, a high replacement rate might mean that they're keeping a young, fit, healthy flock that all their, their, their really important KPIs are really, really cooking on gas and doing really, really well. Whereas somebody else might have a low replacement rate, and what they're doing, yeah, they've got a low replacement rate, but they've got a load of clapped out old ewes, and their output is rubbish. So we've had this. I think they've dropped it now. I said, well, you can't. If, what's the point in putting replacement rate in there if it doesn't mean anything? And, and the thing that you look at in the context of a high replacement rate is, I would just, I would look at this. So if there's a high replacement rate and that's not high, I'm happy. If there's a high replacement rate and a lot of them are dying, I'm very unhappy. <laughs> okay. So again, it just depends. You've just got to have the right information. It's much, much better to know what the mortality rate is than it is to know what the replacement rate is, I would argue. Yeah. So that's quite a good, good example. Okay. And then we had those ones. Right. So we can use lots and lots of things. Um, in terms of KPIs if we want to, and they would all be valid, providing you can measure them and providing you can take action on them, but my, apart from replacement rate. But my question to you is, how useful is body condition and do body condition scoring in a flock as a KPI? So you've got choices. Everyone has to put their hand up for one of them. So think about what we've just said about KPIs. Do you think, um, as a KPI body condition score, is not at all useful? Okay. A bit useful. Fairly useful. Okay, yeah, a few people creeping in. Very useful. Extremely useful. Oh, good, okay, the converted are there. So extremely, so I'm going to prove to you it's extremely useful, okay, for a variety of reasons. So... You're used to seeing this. I thought maybe I'm, but you are used to seeing this. So do you score in half scores or quarter scores? OK, start using quarters. It's a big difference between two and a half and three. Don't make your mind up. Just call it two and three quarters. It's dead easy. I kid you not. OK, it is dead easy. Massive difference between two and a half and a three. Don't worry your brain. Just call it two and three quarters. <laughs> OK, so I don't need to go into that. And we're all used to, I think, the fact that we are looking at this production cycle and using body condition score to hit targets at certain times, yeah? And that's what you would use it for, yes? Presumably. So we're all familiar with the fact that body condition score in the run-up to mating, and we would call it tupping, but run-up to mating, is the effect of ovulation on ovulation rate. 
we will be looking at the implantation period. Yep. Hold that thought. I'm coming to it. You're getting ahead of me. Well done. No, no, that's good. Okay, so, and then placental development, uh, and it has an effect all the way around birth weight, colostrum, milk yield, um, and recovery of body, and I'll come back to that because that is really one of the critical points. So it has a massive effect at each stage, okay? And I think everyone would be used to that. So these are the sorts of targets that we've been using for years. But what we've been able to do over the last four or five years since we've been able to use the EID technology is we've been able to look at much more longitudinal effects and also the effect of you being in body condition score at one point and the effect that her body, uh, body condition score change has going forward, not just to the next point in the production cycle, but beyond that and beyond that and beyond that. Okay, so we're now looking at much longer term effects. It's not just a question of hitting that target, come what may, at a specific time. So with EID, we can look at changes, and we can look at weight and weight changes. So of course, what body condition is, all body condition is, is a way that we can use simply by palpating and, and handling the animal is what we're really doing is taking a view on what reserve of energy she's got on board. That's what it is. It's just saying how much energy reserve has she got on board. And again, going back to the way the animals evolved, evolution says to that animal, if I haven't got enough energy on board, I'm not going to have two lambs, I'm only going to have one. I mean, it, it really is that simple, okay? Um, but you've also got to appreciate, I think, and what we're finding now is that the long-term effects are much greater than that because it isn't just a question of um, the you going up to tupping and you're flushing and she's in the right condition and she gives more eggs. The intrinsic cycle within that ovary is at least four to five months ago, which is coming, starting to answer your question. And if we go back even further, it goes back to when it was in utero and how well her mother was actually performing and the body condition score that she was in. So it's a, it's a lifetime issue, okay? And one of the things that we are doing um, when, we, when we look at this is because we've been body condition scoring and every time we've scored, we've weighed the individual animal, what we're looking at now is whether or not we'll never be able to do group body condition score and weight because the variation in weight of ewes is massive. Um, you know, you can take the same body condition score, the same breed of animal, the same parity, the same age of you, and the body condition will vary by 20, uh, uh, sorry, the weight will vary by 20 kilos. But what we are looking at now is whether or not we can write an algorithm for the individual animal. So she might come, the individual animal will come through the crate um, and we would actually log her weight at body condition score three or thereabouts once a year. And then we would use the algorithm which would use variation and standard error around that weight to body condition score at other stages. So when we wanted animals that had lost a lot of condition, we could use weight. We wouldn't need to handle every ewe. Because that, that thing there will do it all automatically. So as so long as I keep sheep going, the doors open and shut automatically and it'll auto-draft and do everything itself. The, or the only thing it needs me there for is to do a body condition score. If it's only weight, we can set it up to put the, put the uh, hunter away at the back and set it up to get, take 300 ewe lambs and we want to wait on the ewe lambs. And so long as you tell the hunter away to stay there, they'll just do it themselves and you walk away. It's brilliant. <sighs> right, okay. So, and this, but the project that we did goes back to um, uh, when I was out in Australia about 10 years ago for a short while, and then when I went back out to New Zealand a few years later, um, a, a project called Lifetime Wool, and it actually would be, if you get a chance to Google it, just Google it and have a look. Uh, it's an Australian project, and basically what they did was they used body condition as their sole KPI. So they managed the whole flock to, hit the to improve body condition and also make sure that ewes didn't fall outside of a quite a tight range at any stage. And they did that with flocks, and they found that... Um, the orange line there was where they used to be, and the blue line was where they got to. Now, that's wool production. It's slightly different. But I saw that, and I thought, oh, hang on a minute. There's got to be something here. We've got to be able to hang our hats on body condition score more, even in a meat-producing flock. 
So we did, basically, and that's where these measurements start to come from. And we started to do, particularly, as I said, the, the 56 days. But it also becomes really important to have the 90-day weight of lambs as well. Because, and the question that you were asking was, that the amount of time and the amount of dry matter that those ewes need from weaning to mating to get back to where they need to be is often underestimated. So it really does drive those decisions as to A, when you wean lambs, and B, how you prioritise then what you give to lambs and what you give to ewes. And it was those sorts of decisions. So we were using the eight-week weight and the 90-day weight and looking at those, and that was really driving it. So there's the KPIs that we wanted, and there's our lambs below 17 kilos. So not only we're we looking for the ones to hit the target, but we're also looking to minimise the number missing the target. So I've got a little example here. So this is what these flocks look like, OK? So this is, um, I, I know, when was I there? Fortnight ago, no, fortnight ago. No, a week ago. Oh, God. I'm, I'm losing it now. It seems like an age since I left home yesterday. Um, so this is one of the flocks on the project. So what you're looking at there is up the left-hand side body condition score, and they're done to quarter scores. Not to be clever, but literally, it's, I find with these guys, they all look at me like I've got two heads. And then within about um, two months of starting it, they're really, really good at this now. And they're all doing quarter scores because they know it just makes sense. Um, up the left-hand side, and then we've got the various stage in the year. And the blobs there represent the bigger the blob, the more using that body condition score. Okay, So what we're aiming for is for them to be as close together around the target as we want. So what you see is that when we first started the project with this flock, it was lean and it was all over the place. And the reason for that was they'd had a really nasty brush with homonchosis and they'd got a history with homonchus and it was crippling them. Okay, So that was one of the first things we had to put right. Um, but they were lean and they were all over the place. And so they went through that first year. So all of the blue blobs represent that flock. So all of the spreadsheets of the body condition scores of that flock in that year. And you can see that, yeah, it went, you know, it was all over the place. But at the end, we weaned early. We had 110 days to do it, and we priorita prioritised the dry matter like hell to get from there to there, those blue blobs, by the time we went to mating in the next year. Yeah? So then those blue blobs transfer to being those red ones at the start of the next year. So a massive difference. Okay. What happened to the eight-week weights and the small lambs, you might ask? Well, there you are. In the year where they were really skinny, 19.6 kilos, um, only 42% of the lambs hit the target, and 23% were small. In the following year, we hit 21.6 kilos, and we got down to 18% with 64% of the lambs hitting the target. Now, you will have all noticed that the next year, things went awry again. So let's go back to that there. And they did, so now we're looking at the green blobs. And everything was going quite well with the green blobs. They were good here, and they were okay when we got them through to there. And then at scanning, not too bad. And then at lambing, they've dropped. And the reason why they dropped at that stage was that when they were lambing in March and Christmas Eve, I was sat just about to put my feet up. My phone went, WhatsApp. Um, you're not going to believe this, Leslie, but I, this is the manager. Uh, I was doing some fencing this afternoon, and I just snapped my Achilles tendon. And then the wheels came off of the management of the flock because he had to rely on less experienced people to run the flock. And he, ever since he's had a lameness problem, he's found difficult. And, you know, and you could watch the lameness, the body condition coming off them, and the performance of the flock go back down again. So it just goes to show, I mean, obviously that was force majeure, but it was why we ended up with very poor performance in 2015. That's gone back up again. 2016 and 2017, things have improved again because he's got it back on his, on its feet. But he's still suffering. I was there a week ago, and we had a real sit down, and I said, right, come on, you've really got to get this lameness thing sorted because you can go through the software and we can pull out the lame ewes and we can find a lot of these little guys on the lame ewes. Okay? So, 
And we've got all sorts of other stuff. So as you might expect, we can start to put a value on it. So the body condition score of a U at Lamming, we were finding that every body condition score more that ewes had was worth about 5.4 kilos of lamb weaned at, at around about 90 days. So you can start to put some figures on it. But there were some other things as well. So what we also found, and, and this is litter size, as you might expect, better body condition, better litter size when we pregnancy scanned them. But also, what we've also been able to find, because of the longitudinal thing is, that what was really important was not just to get them in the right body condition score um, at mating, but to continue the body weight increase all the way through to scanning. So there's been a school of thought, certainly with us, that says, well, do you know what? If you hit that target at mating and she's good, you can afford to let her lose a little bit of condition through to mid-pregnancy. Don't you believe it? No, you're shaking your heads. And a lot of our guys have been doing it because they think, oh, I'll save some money. But we've now got loads of data to say, we can't afford to do it. We can't afford to let these use fall outside of the range, target range for body condition at any time. Um, and, and, and it's even more pronounced when you, this is, these are shearlings, so these would be our um, first time lammers, and it's even more pronounced if you've got young animals as well. For obvious reasons, they're still growing. And this is a really interesting one, and this comes to the point that you were making as well, that here we've got, as you might expect, the more body condition score use lost um, between lambing and eight weeks, i.e. the more reserve they use to produce milk, the heavier their lambs were at eight weeks. Okay. The one on the left is U body condition score, so how much body condition they put up between weaning and mating the previous year, and the graph's at least as steep. So that it's a much greater effect if they weren't putting weight on the previous year, you were still gonna pay you were gonna pay for it at eight weeks. You couldn't make it up, in other words. A much longer term effect. Um, now, one of the interesting things about this is that that holds true if the ewe can't, hasn't got enough grass in front of her. If you put enough grass in front of those ewes, it doesn't, doesn't matter so much they haven't got body condition to lose because the thin ewes will eat more. And we had one really, really, really good spring, and I've got about six farms in Wales who were doing this as well. Um, and they did it, and for that was the only year we had no effect of body condition score on eight-week weight, because basically the fit ewes just ate what they needed and didn't lose body condition score. The thin ewes didn't have it to lose this time, but they ate more, and their lambs just did as well. It was quite interesting. So it You're they, they won't overeat? They won't overeat, no. The ewes didn't in, in lactation, so where there was lots and lots of grazed grass available, the fit ewes just stayed where they were. They didn't lose it, but they used the grass that was there. The thin ewes made up for it by eating more. They must have done. That's the only way they could have done it to get the performance out of their lambs. So it would have been flat. There was no effect. And again, there you've got changing ewe body condition score weaning to mating. So. That particular flock then, and I think the question that was coming there, what's the cost? And we can actually look at that as well. So we can look at that and say, well, how much is, is that, uh, that going to cost us in terms of dry matter? And we can calculate it so we can actually put body condition score up the side. We can work out how many kilos roughly of body, of body weight that is. And we can put, as we would use metabolizable energy, we can put how much energy and therefore how many kilos of dry matter of grass we need for that flock. And then you can put it in a spreadsheet and you can say, the skinny year, I needed 150,000 kilos of dry matter over 110 days to stand a chance of getting that flock back where it needed to be. The following year, when they were not so skinny, it was 100,000 kilos of dry matter. Now the implications for what you can do with lambs and what you can't do with lambs, and how whether or not you can sustain it or whether or not you're gonna make it, is massive. So you're driving the whole thing from body condition and the fact that you know we have to keep not only hitting those targets, but from an efficiency point of view, we need to not be far away from those targets 
at any time. Does that, does that make sense? I get so wound up in this project, I've sort of lived and breathed it for four or five years. I'm trying to sort of now um, test myself to be able to get some of these um, things into things we can digest. But massive difference on a farm. 50,000 kilos of dry matter is big, big amounts of dry matter. So 50% less. Okay. So, um, and again, you know, we're looking at 90-day weights. So those are reason 90-day weights over two years anyway. So big, big difference. Um, but this, is, again, is really important because where we get higher 90-day weights, it means that we're going to be able to get more lambs away, we've got less competition for dry matter, and you're more likely to be able to keep you using the right body condition. So it really becomes very important. Remember I was saying to you before about lamb growth rate and some of our farmers being really quite... Um, uh, laissez-faire about whether or not lambs are growing fast because it doesn't really matter. Well, it does really matter because the knock-on effect is that their ewes are likely to be suffering if they're, not, um, if they're not getting their lambs away. Conversely, and I think this comes back to the point that was made at the back there, one of the other farms on the project had a much, much higher body condition generally. So this flock was w operating at a higher scanning percentage. They would scan at well over 200%. It was um, basically a mule flock, Elaine, for, from, for, you, for your interest, but some of them would be Texel crosses to try and sort of tam temper it down a little bit. Um, but much higher. So you can see there, most of those ewes are body condition score three and a half with a few tailed either side, but really tight, much, much fitter all the way through. And what we did find was at very high levels of body condition, uh, I think I've become more relaxed about them being three and a half, four. I'm quite happy about that now with our breeds because that's given them a bit more robustness. But when they were getting over to towards body condition score four and above, we are able to demonstrate a negative impact on scanning percentage performance generally. So again, you can go too far, as you might expect, yeah? Um, and so, you know, we used all sorts of management interventions to be able... So the skinny flock that you looked at, and, and it's been a real long, hard road with this flock. It's a difficult flock, it's a difficult farm. Homonchus, it's got triple resistant um, homonchus. <coughs> it's a bloody nightmare, in fact. Um, but a great manager. So we have used paddock grazing. We've upped the ante on the grazing quality and how we utilise it. So by paddock grazing, we would say that we can get two tonnes of dry matter per hectare more in a season. That's, again, that's a lot of dry matter by managing it from a paddock point of view and the quality's better. We've intervened, so some of these small lambs now, rather than leaving them on and letting them just take their chances, we'll lift them off at eight weeks and introduce them to some feed and um, make a better job, up job of them. We've increased and improved the feeding of the ewes. It's now TMR-based, very little concentrate going in there. But prolapses and twin lamb disease, what's prolapses and twin lamb disease? We just don't see it anymore. Um, we've been using faecal egg counting a lot because we don't really have a lot else that we can do. He actually does his own, so we now have um, Effect Pack Gen 2. I've got one as well. Um, where we do a faecal egg counts, but it's um, we take a photograph and it's cloud-based and interpreted and we get the results. So um, I, I also get um, electronic results and what we can start to do now on a farm like this is we can start to do contamination mapping. So we can really use faecal egg counts for what they were meant for really. We can start saying, well, we know what that f what's going on to that field now and therefore in particularly when it's Himonchus, in two to three weeks' time, we know damn well that we could have a really big problem. Yep. Yeah, it goes into a special light well, and, and, and it f that oh, it's, it's really... It's yeah, I can give you a website to go and have... But basically, the eggs float up, and there's a special camera that takes a photograph, so you get a, a digital image. And at the moment, the operator has to go and click on each egg, and then it just counts them like that. Yeah, so this one, you see, I would, I mean, I've done lots of the old McMaster and so on, and to be honest, my eyesight's not good enough for it anymore, anyway. And I can't, unlike you, I'm not spending my weekend doing it, whereas now I've got a Gen 2. I've still got to prepare it, but it literally is minutes now. So, yeah, there's a 30-minute stand time, but you just go away and do something else. Uh, well, at the moment, it's, it, the screen comes up and somebody who knows what they're doing actually uses a clicker to count. Somebody, somebody else is just counting. 
But I mean, it, it, at night, over, overnight, it goes to New Zealand to be done because obviously they're working then and during the daytime. So now I think they've got it down to during the daytime UK time into a 15 minute turnaround. So it's almost pen side. It's almost pen side. It is cool. It's called Effect Pack Gen 2. The cost. The cost of the kit is about £400. But what about the cost to get them to come? Well, you pay, I think it's about £400 initial outlay, and then it's something like £300 a year for up to 100 So what we've got is some of our vet practices are doing it, and they will have one in a vet practice, and you know people will send samples in. Or you get one farmer doing it, and, and several farmers will share it which is maybe, I'll come on to that in a minute, because I know I've talked to Robin about one or two things. Um, so faecal egg counting and also using um, effective drenches when we need to use them. We make damn sure that they're effective and we use them as little as possible. So lots of things that we've done. Um, so just to finish this off then, with the body condition scoring uh, as a KPI and, and improvements that we've had, I think where I've got to, where I don't know, you've all got the, 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 the I don't want the ping pong balls back necessarily, um, but where we have got to is that, you know, we've been using this picture and the fact that what we're driving for is the more perfect where it was in the red and it was doing what we wanted to do and we're getting it closer together. We've been using that KPI to drive all the management interventions. So all the ping pong balls are starting to stick to body condition score. So the fact that, you know, if you've got that and the grazing's not there, you're making decisions based on body condition score and the need to keep it within those blobs. I, I, I call them Nigel's blobbies because Nigel at Nottingham University does them for me. How the hell he does them, I don't know. It's beyond me, but it, Nigel blobbies, they're really good. Um, things like you feeding and how we do that and how we treat ewes in the winter, driven by body condition score using things like dry matter measurements, ward sticks, body condition score, even things like lameness. You know, our vets get really excited by the fact that farmers won't take lameness seriously and deal with it. I believe you me, if you're driving your flock with KPI as your key, uh, sorry, body condition score as your key KPI, you, e you are not going to tolerate lameness because every time you go through those outlying horrible little blobs down the bottom there, are your lame ones. Once you get down to a very low body condition score, body condition scoring is really, really good, but the other thing that we found is that once you get down to a body condition score below two, certainly with our sheep, um, the weight cost is about double. Okay, so one of the one of the things we had with that skinny flock, we had 110 days, and I worked out, and, and actually the, the, it was it was quite. But what we found was when we looked at the weight gain that was needed for those groups of animals to get from say body condition score one and a half to two, it was double what the weight gain was that you need to get from two and a half to three, roughly speaking. So again, it's really really brought it home to me that at no stage can you afford those use to slip sub two because the cost, the efficiency is, is so high and the long-term effects on her performance. Is, is that mostly caused by Well, in this case, it was hemonchosis that had caused the problem, but it, it becomes a downward spiral because if you get a farm that, is, that has poor body condition or even one that's at the other end, which is habitually fat, it takes a lot to break into it because it gets worse and it's usually somebody who's perhaps you know, doesn't want to let their lambs go. You know, what, what we do now with this flock is that he will, he will body condition score at weaning. We'll plug those body condition scores as a group into my spreadsheet. I will say, right, we need X kilos of dry matter to get these girls back to where they need to be. He will go out and he'll know what his covers are and he'll come back and say, uh-oh, I'm 25,000 kilos short from my predictions. And I'll say, well, you know what you've got to do? And he has to sell lambs. Simple as that. It's not a decision. It's just you have to do it. So, um, so hopefully you all thought it was a useful KPI. Most of you thought it was a useful KPI. For me now, if I can get people doing this, all of these other ping pong balls, they'll pick the right one up at the right time and start to pick the right one up at the right time by driving it by body condition. 
If we can use the EID to help us do it without having to body condition score five times a year, I'll vote for that as well. Because in January, out in the yard, it was actually nice and warm the other day, but the day he busts his Achilles, the year he busts his Achilles tendon, I went down with the young lad and we housed the whole flock and we body condition scored them. And I was body condition scoring after about every 10, I was having to do this. Okay. So in summary then, so I think we can use body condition scores as a really useful compound KPI uh, uh, to, to latch lots of other things onto. And it's a driver, something that we drive the flock with and we don't just react to. And I think, you know, sometimes it's, well, we've got a body condition score and then we'll decide what we're going to do. I'm kind of turning the ante round on that now and saying it's a driver, it's not something we just react to gives us robustness. One of the things that I know sheep farmers the world over will say, well, weather is, and looking at the weather out there, I think you guys have got more of an excuse than we have. Um, but, you know, weather is something that's, oh, well, you know, we can't help the weather. Well, of the years we've been doing this project, I can promise you that the flocks where the ewes are in good condition, they are much more robust and they are much more able to ride out the lumps and bumps that weather throws at you than the flocks that are, you know, open to... Um, being uh, to, to low body condition score. And the new technology is, well, like I say, I've waited all my career for it. It's really good. I'm glad I've had it to, at this stage because, but don't drown in it, you know? If you're going to use it, decide what it is you want out of it before you go in there because I know what it's like. We'd be faced with tens of thousands of bits of information. And the, I was working with the university and the professor said, oh, it'd be fine, it'd be fine. Just give us the data, we'll sort it all out. And I said... Kevin, you don't know what you're talking about because farm data is never clean, is it? It's, there's always bits missing here and there and so on. So the first two years of the project, we spent just literally trying to work out how we were going to handle it because it's not as simple as bits of data. To do this work, you've got to be able to link the ewe to her progeny. So you've got to have the static data in the system that is the ewe's data, when she was born, what her breed is, blah de blah de blah And then you've got to be able to handle all the moving data and link it from ewe to lamb. And that, most of the software can't cope with. Okay, so I'll just leave you with a, with a little, um, to baffle eavesdroppers, Wendy and Molly sometimes conversed in barcode. And one final slide, um, and that is to say that the work that we were doing on this, it was a bit of a side issue, uh, but one of the problems that the farm that I've showed you with the skinny ewes had um, in terms of its output was that it was struggling with its replacements. So this is a bit of an itty-bitty graph because he started off weighing his ewe lambs a little itty-bitty, and then the year with the red and the and the yellow, we got serious about weighing them very regularly, and we now have real, they've got to hit these targets at this time, at this time, at this time, at this time. Because again, we could track them back and we could prove that when they weren't hitting it, their lifetime performance was slipping off. Okay? So I was down there last Friday and he got a bit of a telling off because his ewe lambs were up on the hill and they were struggling a little bit. So we had to decide what we we're going to do with them because we know they've got to keep and that's really important as well. And that's a project that we're doing at the moment, okay? I, I mean, one of the other things that I was talking to Robin about on the phone, and she was saying to me um, that I think you face some of the issues, and it came up um, here. You've got a nice long list here, I think, guys, haven't you, to, to have a think about. Lots of other <coughs> meetings you can do <laughs> at some stage. Um, but particularly, and it was raised from the back, I think. Where was it? Where was the... Oh, good sheep vets, Yeah. Antelmintics and education. Because I think you're about to go whereby all of your sheep medicines are going to go to vets. Yes. Okay. Um, and that can have positives, but I'm guessing, or I'm thinking that in your situation, if you've not got enough good sheep vets and they're hundreds of miles away, that could just be a bit of a challenge to the welfare of your animals. And it was just really to sort of throw this out to you because we have a similar problem, but nowhere near as bad as that because obviously England... UK is a lot smaller, but we still we don't have very many good sheep vets. The ones that are good are really good, don't get me wrong, but a lot of them, they don't get enough contact with sheep, so it's not fair to expect that. 
But what um, one or two uh, of the vets have done is they've set up and they have like flock health clubs now. So they'll have a group around a, a vet perhaps that, that is interested in sheep and that helps them with their expertise. And they, they, that people pay a relatively small amount on an annual basis, but that actually locks people in and then they can converse electronically or they might get together for a meeting or they a virtual meeting. They can support each other when it comes to doing fecal egg counts or, well, I did a test to do this and my aunt. And, and it was just really, I was talking to Robin on the phone and I just thought while I was here, I would throw that out to you as maybe a way that you could think about getting around this problem because it would horrify me, you know, if you, if you need, let's say, you, you know, you're doing some fecal egg counting or whatever and you do actually need to drench because Himonchus will go from zero to absolutely hammering you within days and you won't necessarily get any warning. If you had to wait for several days to get something that you needed to treat animals, I'd be really worried about that. And I just wonder whether the Flock Health Club, you know, with a group like you've got here, might not be something that... Um, well, thank you. It's been great meeting you guys. Absolutely great. <laughs>